All right, perfect. All right. So hello, everyone. Welcome to another Oakland Heritage Alliance Zoom event. Before we get started, I want to tell you about our next upcoming event. On Thursday, January 26th at 7 p.m., Mary McCosker, president of the Lafayette Historical Society, will be discussing her new book, Building the Caldecott Tunnel. The tunnel is an Oakland landmark. So join us Thursday, January 26th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. We will send out an email to advertise this event. This is also our annual meeting, so we'll be voting on um, board members and things like that. So definitely check that out. We also encourage you to become an Oakland Heritage Alliance member. Your membership in ensures that there's a strong voice for historic preservation in Oakland. We represent your voice at City Hall and we bring you programming through events like this, walking tours, the Partners in Preservation Awards, and our print newsletter. So if you want to be a part of historic preservation in Oakland, please consider joining Oakland Heritage Alliance via our website. And now for what you've all been waiting for, I want to introduce you to Patty Donald, our presenter for tonight. I first came across the Cohen Bray house just by walking by and was amazed by the beauty of the house. I wanted to know more, so I went on a tour, went to their Harvest Festival, and became a member of the organization. Patty is the president of the Victorian Preservation Center of Oakland at the Cohen Bray house and is also the great granddaughter of the original owners of the house. She retired in 2017 from the city of Berkeley, where she developed and built the Shorebird Nature Center and Straw Bale Classroom. For 38 years, she ran the environmental education programs, the teacher and docent training program, and shoreline cleanups, kite festival, base festival, and the adventure playground at the Berkeley Marina, which I definitely enjoyed as a, as a kid. She now is a grandmother, is on the board of the Rot Rotary Nature Center Friends and Things That Creep. And with that, I will hand things off to Patty. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, I do want to get an idea of how many people have never been to the Cohen Bray House, and maybe that's why you're all here. You want to see what it's all about, and hopefully you will get excited about it and come join us. But let's see, Daniel, how did you want to, to do that? You want people to put something in the chat? Yeah, so if you can put something in the chat, and then I will uh, do a quick count. I'm so just you... trying to get a number of how many people have never been there. And I, I, can, I recognize some names. Okay, good. Okay, I see it all coming up here on the left. One... Okay, cool. okay, good. We will, we will entice you. All right, good. I will start at the beginning and go from there. I know Betty's been there. I know there's uh, Dorcas has been there. I recognize some names. Um, so I'm very glad you're there and uh, if I forget anything, all of you can fill in. I would like to point out also that my sister, Nancy Donald, who is the vice president of the Victorian Preservation Center of Oakland is also here. And um, at the end for questions, she's been doing the collections at the house for more years than I've been retired and longer than that. Um, so uh, she has lots of information about those sorts of things. And she works a lot with the volunteers who are interested in that. So if you have questions about that as we get to the end, uh, she'll be there to answer your questions. And I think what um, we'll do right now is I'll go ahead and share a screen, Daniel. Sounds good. And yeah, for the record, there's about uh, 10 people out of about 40 who have not been. So okay. Let you know. And also, if anyone has questions, I'll be kind of handling questions at the end. So feel free to put questions in the chat and I will uh, read them off uh, at the Q&A time. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes. All right, I'm gonna go into, and this is all at the top. Can I move it? Yes, going down here. <clears throat> Okay, I'm very grateful for Daniel and Laura and Charles who went over the show with me and helped me figure out exactly what are the best things that you guys as an organization might wanna see. So I changed my opening slide and added a picture of the house that was drawn by Emilita Cohen, who was our great aunt, who was born in the house and lived all her life, 90 years in the house and started the process of saving the house and reaching out to OHA and getting their help uh, to continue saving it. 
So Emilita did uh, linoleum block carving and we sell her cards at the house. And if you like her work, it helps us out. So see how this front porch is? That's what we wanna bring it back to. But these, she has about six of these of the house. And in each one, there's something a little bit different. There's a, always a postman and a dog in the pictures. Um, so I, I love this picture, but I'm so glad to be able to share this with you. I am going to be talking about the people that made this house the way it is and the people that are working on it now to save it and how it got to be in the condition it is. Uh, we're going to be talking about the challenges that we've been going through recently and try to get you involved in it. And the reason why this house is special is that I've, as I've been getting involved in social media, I'm learning that there's very, very few houses like that are like ours. Uh, most of the old houses have either been torn down or most of them have been restored in ways that don't look like historic houses anymore. And I guess we're kind of lucky. We have survived in the way that we are passively preserved. We had no money and we had uh, no opportunity to change the house because of the lack of money in the house, which in the way is, has helped us quite a lot. So here we go. <clears throat> the house is about the family. And in particular, this is the couple, my great grandparents. On the left, my great great grandparent, Alfred Cohen, Alfred Andrew Cohen, and his wife, Emily Gibbons. And on the right, Watson Augustus Bray and his wife, Julia Bray. And in the bottom are the four children who grew up in the house. Emilita, which you'll see throughout this with the the yellow heart on her is the one who lived for 90 years in the house. And my grandfather is got a halo around his picture in this one. And I'll point him out in other pictures. But you can't start with the house. You really need to start with the land and the importance of the land. The arrows represent where the house is located in the land, but we honor the Huchin tribe and the people who lived here when time began. Later, when the Spanish missionaries came from 1770 to 1833, this is the land they were in and the house was located there. The Peralta house obviously was there before the house came and there was one other owner of the land before the Bray property came. The Cohens and the Brays approached San Francisco Bay in a couple different ways. You see here on the left is the Golden Gate. This is a David Ramsey uh, picture that I've had for many years. And I love the way that nobody had any airplanes yet. This is a wonderful view of San Francisco Bay and you really get to see the terrain. You can see the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers and the Sierra Nevadas in the back. You can see Mount Diablo and you can see how the East Bay was shaped through earthquakes all the way down to the South Bay. In the time this picture was done in 1865, the Brays had come through the Golden Gate. They had lived in this area here and this got to be too crowded. So they moved to the country across the Bay. So you can see the peninsula of Alameda. Again, looking at the peninsula of Alameda, here on the far right, you can see the Cohen house was very close to the Bray house. But at that time, there was no ch channel dredged between the two properties. You can see Lake Merritt, you can see Coast Guard Island, and the change that has happened in this area here. Both the Brays and the Cohens made their fortunes in transportation, one of transportation of people, and that's A.A. A. Cohen. His property, again, here's Alameda. This red line shows where it was dredged through San Antonio Creek. So here's the Cohen property, and up here is the Bray property. We'll be talking about all of those, starting with the Cohens. So Alfred Andrew Cohen, 
came over with at the age of 17 with $100 in his pocket and uh, decided to utilize his finances. It's, it's one of those tricky things that you talk about at, as a historic house. It's uh, talking about rich white men who owned and built land in the East Bay. But this is a rich white man son who, whose family lost their plantation in Jamaica. It's a coffee plantation when they emancipated the slaves and all their fortune ended. So since he was a middle son, he was given a little bit of money and told to go to, to uh, Alaska originally, and then came back to Marysville when Alaska didn't pan out, and then uh, ended up uh, getting into to law and transportation. One of the things that got him his fortune was when he rebuilt these railroads and sold them to the big four, and who then uh, used the Transcontinental Railroad to uh, bring people to the West Coast. So what you would do before 1863 uh, or is that you start from San Francisco and you would take the ferry system over to Oakland and Alameda. And then that's the ferry down there. He had three or four ferries. This is El Capitan. And then you would get off the ferry and get onto the train. And you'd go down to Warm Springs or Niles, which you can on BART today. And then you would go over to his personal hotel, the Warm Springs Hotel, and in the far country, which actually was a hot springs at the time, but because of the earthquakes and things, the springs disappeared. So when he sold that property and the railroad, he was able to increase his value. Our claim to fame is that the trains for the first month came to his personal rail station in Alameda before they finished the Oakland Mole a month later. I love these trains, aren't they gorgeous? So up here, he had about 106 acres, and this is actually his second house that was built in 1870. It had three solid floors and an elevator that went from the bottom to the top. And Emily went and saw the elevator and thought about her rambunctious children and decided that they'd close off the elevator and use the stairs so they all had large walk-in closets. These pictures show this amazing library that was in the walking way, goes all the way up three floors into the gallery, second and third floor. Here's the entryway, the first floor, and then this is the parlor. Alfred Henry was the second son of six children. One is not, uh, has not been born yet in this picture, and uh, we'll talk about her a little more. Alfred Henry and his brothers were sent away to boarding school at the age of seven. So even though they had this 106 acres, which included a bowling alley, a summer house, a huge dairy, a large chicken house, uh, and orchards, uh, and a huge farm area and stables. He didn't spend much of his time here except on holidays. And I think the reason why he was sent to school is because when Alfred Andrew Cohen's parents lost their fortune, he was pulled out of school at an early age and missed out on the education he thought he was going to get. So he wanted to make sure his children got that education. Unfortunately, not very long later, about 27 years, at the youngest daughter was going to be married and have her reception at this gorgeous house. And apparently the plumber, who was the one who did the lead roofing at the time, left a coal up in the roof and it burned through. Now there's a story of the reason why there was no water pressure, which I'll get into in the next couple slides. But unfortunately, there was no fire hydrants nearby and the house burned to the ground. But because they were getting ready for this wedding reception, they were doing remodeling inside. So they pulled a lot of the things into the summer house and into the bowling alley. These pieces were saved from the fire. This is the summer house and the bowling alley here. 
this dog right here, we don't know whether it's the 50 cent dog or the $5 dog was part of the Fernside collection as many of the items you're gonna see as we get into the public rooms of the house going on in this program. Now, the reason why there wasn't any water pressure in the house was because there was a lawsuit going on because they were starting to dredge through the property between Sather's and Cohen's. And Emily Cohen was so mad at the city for taking over that she said, we don't want your stinking fire hydrant on our property. You leave us alone. And they did. So there was no fire hydrant. And they dug the channel. Here is the dug channel. And then right here is where Sausal Creek used to flow into the San Antonio Creek. And now it was blocked from flowing in this direction. So this is that intersection of where that arrow was, right where Sausal Creek runs into San Antonio Creek. And this is where they dredged through the property between Peter Sather and the Cohen property. Now you notice it says Fernside Station. Part of the deal that Cohen made when he sold the property to the big four was they said, I get my own private station right on the edge of my property. And it pissed off the big four to no end. And so they do horrible things like trapping his private rail car in the rail yard and making him wait to get his rail yard car out and various other things. If you read the story of the big four and A.A. Cohen, he, uh, he thought they were all pompous poos. So uh, kind of interesting that way. And I'm gonna go up Suzzle Creek past Derby property. This is where the house is right now. W.A. Bray had this large property that I'll be focusing on mainly. And then this property in the Fruitvale area and this property over here. All of this total three stars is about 200 acres. Focusing on the first big star, it, it used to be Sherman Road, but it was Foothill. And then again, down uh, Fruitvale. And then this used to be Adams Street. It turned to East 14th and then to International Street here. Uh, Howard Street was named after his youngest son and Julia Street named after his wife and his one of his twin daughters. And this was where the main homestead is. If you look a little bit closer, this is where the Cohen Bray house is now in the asparagus patch part of the garden. So Watson Augustus Bray and his brother decided to come to California from New Jersey. And they did it by taking a herd of cattle from the east to the west coast, which when they came to the gold rush, everybody was very, very glad to see them. And he got a lot of money for the cattle that he brought over. And he started a mercantile business. And he used the ship, the Alma, as one of the scow schooners. In those days, they were the 18 wheelers. So where Cohen moved people, Bray moved items. And the scow schooner, I'm a sailor, so I really like this. They're flat bottom boats and they have a keel that they can, or a centerboard that they can pull up so they can go very shallow up into the agricultural areas and offload the hay, which they brought back to San Francisco to feed the horses, technically gasoline, which I guess make gas, but um, yes, that's, that's one of the ways they did it. You also hear about them carrying oyster shells and lots of lumber. Ships were very, very important in those days to bring Bray his commodities. And he had a family friend who was the captain of the Three Brothers, which was the largest sailing ship at the time to come into San Francisco Bay. And they were very close friends with the Brays. And we have documentation of the dates they sailed the ship and it took 112 days to go from England around the Horn and back to California again. I'll talk about Cummings again. So the Bray Estate was located here. And in those days, it was quite beautiful with large expansive areas. This used to be the Piedmont of Oakland. This was the country and this was a retired gentleman who came 
retiring and then tried their hand at farming and other wonderful things. Cummings was built a property right here on the corner. Uh, there's actually an apartment building and a wonderful tanquera there with great Mexican food at the corner now. But this is what it used to look like. And the Cohen Bray House would have been behind it here. The other neighbors had equally beautiful houses in this area. And Derby lived across the street. This was Derby's estate, quite beautiful. And now Montgomery, well, then there was Montgomery Wards, and now there's a school. But some of you may remember Montgomery Wards. It used to be at this corner across the street there. So as we move on, you can see what the Bray Estate looked like in a color drawing and in a photograph. Uh, in 1886, no, sorry, 1865, there was an earthquake and the top part of this house was damaged and then rebuilt. But these beautiful trees are gonna be part of a story I'm gonna be telling you soon. So remember how beautiful these trees look in this photograph too. So the Brays were the post office. That's why uh, they were the only ones that had a mailbox nearby. And so they were the first post office in the area. And Bray was quite well known in the area and served on the board of mills, which Emma did. And Emma's got a heart around her head. Um, her mother and father had two sets of identical twins, 21 months apart. Here you can see two of the boys who survived into adulthood. And Julia is the female twin whose baby sister, um, Mary, died when they were three and a half years old. I think they had two or three more children who didn't survive into adulthood. So in 1882, Emma. Emma was engaged to be married to Alfred Henry Cohen. And of course they did all the right things and she was sent to New York City and they had to separate them for a year to make sure they still believed in it. But they were pretty dead set that they were going to be getting married. And so the Bray family gave the garden property to Emma and in 1882 and the Cohen family not to be outdone furnished it. When they got married on February 28th, there was over 500 people at the wedding. The governor was there and all of the important people in the county. The wedding was in the house and the wedding guests arrived with their carts through this area and circled around. And Captain Cumming, who lived right across the street, or sorry, right there, he supplied his sailors. And they climbed into the trees and put Japanese lanterns with little candles in them to light the way. And it must have looked absolutely glorious. At the end of the wedding, the couple was supposed to get onto the train and go to Del Monte for their honeymoon. But they decided to steal around back and go into the master bedroom on the second floor and watched the wedding guests as they departed the wedding and spent their first night uh, in the house itself. Now, this is all lovely and beautiful. And unfortunately, having the braise across the street only lasted for another year. The Bray brothers business was being embezzled by two employees. And in order to pay back the loans for the business, they had to sell all 200 acres. And at one time, the house itself was also a possibility to be part of the acreage that was going to be sold. So they had to go to the Supreme Court to uh, justify that it was a gift to his daughter and that that was not part of the property. And I think that has a lot to do with how important it is to save this house, is that it could have been gone a year after it, um, it was built. And luckily, they were able to hold on to it. Here's another of Emily's drawings. And there's the postman. And there's the gardener. I don't see where the dog is. Oh, under the, the dog's under the tree over here. So luckily, they saved the house. And life went on. So Emma Bray, was, Emma Bray Cohen was a socialite. She loved to play the piano. She was in the music department at Mills. And she, her 
piano is a Steinway. So Alfred Henry, being a sportsman, got a horse, and his horse was named Sable Steinway. So they were a wonderful couple doing what they could until all the children were made. And that's going to be happening soon. Alfred Henry, even though he studied law and was in his father's office, was kind of undershadowed by such a great lawyer that Alfred Andrew Cohen was. And I think he was more excited about sports and being a rich man's son. He didn't care as much about money, but he got very excited about inventing. And this radio he thought was going to be his success, but unfortunately it didn't turn out that way. There was a fire because he used white gas in the original priming of getting this radio going and it burned down the back barn and he was severely burned at the time and I think losing the patent had a big uh, had a big impact on his depression and uh, he wasn't quite the same after. But they had four beautiful children. Alfreda was named after her father being the firstborn, and Emilita was named after her mother being the lastborn, with Marion and Douglas all being two years apart and Emilita coming six years later. This handsome guy is our grandfather. I love this picture here. So these are Marion's children. This is either William or Kenneth Gilliland, who lived the last 30 years in the house, and Nancy Gilliland. Uh, and this is Alfred and Emma. This is my grandfather, and that's my mother, Barbara, who we'll be talking about soon. And Emilita, who lived after her father died. Her father died in 1925, and Emilita and Emma lived in the house alone until Emma died. So here's Emma Bray Cohen in 1941, one of the house celebrations. Uh, I think it was the wedding engagement party for Nancy, who you saw in the other picture, and her husband. And this is my mother here, Emilita, who lived in the house her life, her whole life, and Marion, who's Nancy's mother, and all the rest of the siblings around. My great aunt is still alive, uh, and uh, that's the only one in this picture. Now, we were all told that we couldn't sit at this table until we were old enough. And now we're all old enough and there's lots of space. So here's a picture of my mother when she got married in 1943, sitting on the armchair, holding on to Emma's hand. And in the picture on the far right, that's my mother in 2012 wearing the same dress that Emma is wearing in 1943. And my mother's wearing her wedding dress in her uh, reception. This is my reception and I'm wearing my mother's wedding dress. And this is Nancy with her baby Carrie and I think Patrick swinging around somewhere in the back. It was hard to get Patrick to sit still in this picture if I remember correctly. So challenges, the family got older. These red ones are when the matriarchs died, uh, the, sorry, the men of the house died. And this is kind of when things started to fall apart. Even though Alfred Henry hadn't made a lot of money when he died in 1925, we're looking through the records and trying to figure out what did Emma live on? And uh, looking through her income tax reports, we're not quite sure what she did. So we're pretty sure that the money pretty much ran out in 1925. So now what do you do? I mean, how many people here have not had to face what we have to face? What happens to your parents' house? What happens to the property? Do you sell them? Well, I think that Emilita pretty much steered us in the direction she wanted to. And she, married, she met very good people like Betty Marvin and other people. And we were able to put the House on the National Register of Historic Places in 73. She also pushed and was part of the, as now an Oakland landmark, which helped. 
And the family then decided when Emilita died that we would create a nonprofit. We would give up the right to inherit and sell the house and use the rest of our lives to raise money to save this house. And luckily, Oakland Heritage Alliance came in uh, with an easement to help us protect the house into the future. And that's why we want to make sure that you know what's going on so that you can help us do that. So let's take a look at the house. It's very impressive compared to a lot of different Victorians. It is a bracketed stick Eastlake style Victorian house. So you can see at the top, these are the brackets and these are the dentals in here. But the Eastlake style means that there's a lot of vertical and horizontal lines to give you height and give you width. It has the, this is the attic and the master bedroom window that the bride and groom looked out to see their wedding. Oop, and I changed it a little bit too quick. This is the tower on the far left. And these are, there are three balconies. There's one on this side, this balcony, and this balcony, which oversee the property. So I'm gonna give you a little tour through the house. We're not gonna be showing you pictures of the second and third floors. So I'll tell you what's there the master bedroom and sitting room, Emilita's bedroom, which she was in for uh, 90 years. And you can see there are pocket doors which join these two bedrooms to this single bath here. And there's another bath down the hall. So two bathrooms on the second story and no bathrooms on the first floor. Alfreda and Marion's room was across the hall. Then the cook's room was there and the maid's room in the back. And if you go up to the attic, the tower maybe was Douglas's room. Maybe it was the schoolroom on the side because he did write something on the wall there. It gives me an idea his bed might have been there. It went something like uh, bed for sale, inquire within. And that was where Emma had her sewing room. And it was the, like I said, the schoolroom because these children were homeschooled until eighth grade because Alfred Henry hated going away to boarding school and he wanted to keep his children around him. So every other generation <laughs> made a different choice. The storage basically contains everything that broke and was brought up to the attic. Lots of broken things in our attic. We're gonna start at the front door, going in through the hallway, this hallway and the major pocket doors and uh, wood that you're gonna see in the first couple of pictures was a wedding present from the Merriweathers who have property, who had property next door. And it's still called the Merriweather Tract, which is quite interesting. Here's the front door. And <clears throat> the gift that she was given by the Merriweathers was the butt end of a virgin redwood log, probably two to 3,000 years old. Uh, it was called, it's called curly redwood. You can see a little bit of the curliness right here. It's kind of striated, kind of zebra stripe that you see through there. It's very unusual and quite beautiful. So this is the entryway and the newel post with the stairs that go up to the top. You can see more brackets in the corners. And this is the East Lake style, the incised flower and leaf pattern and the beveled edges of the paneling and the beautiful design of the ceiling, as you can see in the right here. The ceiling was put together on the floor and, and then lifted into place. Uh, and all of the furniture was in the, these front rooms that we're giving, that we're showing you right now, were came from Tiffany's uh, in New York City. And because Alfred Andrew Cohen had his own rail car, he would go out there periodically and shop for his new daughter-in-law. This is what the parlor looked like in the 1890s. And the main feature in the room was this beautiful bird's eye maple piece here. Uh, all these pictures are still there. These chairs are all still there and the tables, they're not as in good condition as they are in this picture. Now you can see that in the mirror here. Now this mirror is an overmantel mirror that came from Fernside. 
So here it is in this picture over here in an 18 foot tall room with a fireplace underneath. It doesn't fit quite that same way in a 12 foot tall room. But the more you look at this house, the more you see. So the details at the top of the mirror, which is a Herder Brothers piece, the beautiful carved wood that you see there, the beautiful ceiling is decoupaged with four or five different types of wallpapers, the beautiful portraits that are catalog pieces hang in similar places. But the thing I love about this picture is the carved frame. Because it's built in wheat, you can see how important that would be in this house. The dining room, which if you're going to come to our holiday tea, uh, there's still spaces in the holiday tea if you're interested on January 7th. Uh, and our beautiful uh, library which we no longer are able to burn fires in the fireplace, unfortunately, because of the condition of the chimney. Okay, so changes have happened over time. So this is the first floor only, and the most recent change has been in 1992, we increased the original porch that was built in 1896 to be large enough to work with our school classes and it's a lovely covered porch uh, to be able to do extra work. Uh, originally, if you look on this far left picture, there was no porch over here. And from the kitchen, you would go through this door into the laundry and then into the porch. But when you have four kids, the formal dining room gets to be a little heavy and they needed a breakfast room for the kids to eat in. So in 1896, they sealed off these doors and created this breakfast room. Then in 1906, oh, and they created this porch because they got rid of the porch. They created another porch, which has these beautiful windows. And this is our guest shop now. In 1907, when the two chimneys that were here and here twisted and fell into these rooms, these were taken apart and these windows were pushed to the far edge to make this beautiful room, which was decorated in the most uh, populous, uh, modern style at the time, which was the craftsman style. So again, you'll see another mirror on the far left that is the golden age or the gilded age style of Egyptian that came from the Fernside ballroom. The uh, base of that is in the dining room. And that actually blocks the original door that came from the side porch that used to be here. The two chairs in front of the mirror came from A.A. A. Cohen's railroad office, likewise with that oil lamp that's there in that picture. On the right side, that large couch was also from Fernside and made its way into the Cohen Bray house after being rescued from the fire. And if you look down here, you can still see it's, it's singed. Uh, and we have the piece that used to be on the top. See how beautiful that looks. The fireplace, again, is not working because of the sinking of the foundation and the, and the bricks, but the room has been used very happily. It's the coziest room and my favorite in the house. And it's been used for many, many years. This is that same dinner party you saw before with everyone in the room. It was obviously around Christmas time. And at that time, it was tradition to go give the local tree lot the uh, a bottle of and not some sort of alcohol. My sister and I debate which one it was uh, to get whatever Christmas trees were left over in the lot. And then they'd string all the Christmas trees up in the picture rail. So it looked like a smoking lodge. And the family has met here beautifully over the years. My mother's in the middle there with my father and my aunt who's still alive is here. That's uh, myself and my daughters and Nancy and Lynn and Kathy, my sisters. And this is Ken Gilliland, who lived in the house for 30 years with his parents after Emilita died, and his cousins and family who also help with the house. So this is what we've done as a 501c3. 
<clears throat> Nancy's in charge of the cataloging. We'll talk more about that. I'm going to be showing you pictures about all of these things in a minute. And if you'd like to join us for any of these, please come be a docent, be a partner, be a volunteer, or just be a member. Helps us even more. Our school programs are wonderful, and there are fewer kids walking down the street thinking it's a spooky haunted house. It looks a little less scary every day. We do education programs for teens. Emilita saved all these amazing newspapers about every major event that happened. She, collect, she and her family collected for 138 years everything that was important during their lives. This is quite a time capsule of one family's view of the world. And to be able to share this with all ages is quite amazing. Giving kids a chance to get off their computers and use hand tools and get credit for volunteering is part of the fun working with youth groups. And getting large groups who are skilled to help us with some of the big jobs has helped dramatically. We have been able to replace the whole roof. You can see the brand new plywood up here on the far left. And that's not an easy job on these steep roofs. The back porch has been repainted. This is that snow flurry of uh, ceiling wallpapers that I'm replacing. We've had the front gate, which we had uh, put in about 25 years ago, repainted by the Restoration Works International. And recently during the pandemic and after Ken Gilliland, the last family member died two years ago, uh, we were able to get in because finally there wasn't somebody living in the house after 138 years and do a lot of the repairs for the damaged plaster. And we were all wondering what was underneath this thing here. So Dave, Nancy and I pulled off the top, the sides and the back and uncovered this wonderful Locke and Montague range, which was the original stove up until 1925. Unfortunately, they cut off the doors, so we can't see what that looked like. But you can come see it at the house. We also took out the old floors. Unfortunately, they were asbestos, so they dug down into the woodwork, but we replaced it with um, natural linoleum, as you can see on the right, and we repainted everything and cleaned it. And we're hoping to get rid of those lovely bright yellow tiles and put in some white uh, subway tiles soon. Looking and trying to get all the gooey paint off of the hardware and cleaning it up for use was a challenge, but fun to learn about. And we happen to have the catalog that uh, has all these items in it. We also found in a corner of a closet the original pattern of the flooring on the left side and had it replicated, as you can see it on the right side, of what it originally would have looked like in the butler's pantry. It was in pretty bad shape on the left side there. I'm so glad we did it. We also replaced the linoleum or the vinyl that got sunburned in Emilita's bathroom upstairs, and it looks so much better. We still have so much more to go. We have the original brick foundation that is still supporting the house and it's causing quite a problem. The house has not been painted for over 40 years and many of the windows are missing and water is getting into the house as we speak. We want to make sure that things are safe if we're bringing people to the house. So one of the current jobs is just going to be replacing those windows and fixing the dangerous porch so people don't get hurt and rescuing these beautiful balconies and bringing the wood back the way it was. We've only just started and we need help. Luckily, we hired, well, we're not hiring. These are our live-in caretakers. They're living in the house for free. Not really. They have to work 60 hours a month to pay for their room and board. I met Mark as we were building our 
ADU unit in the back of our house. He was the fine carpenter there. He saw me covered with paint getting ready to go to the house to work and asked me what I was doing. I handed him a brochure and told him. And the next day he had his application in. And we had many great applicants, but they by far, we are so lucky to get them. So I do encourage you to come and meet Mark and Elizabeth as you visit our house. We went into Ken's room and cleaned it from top to bottom and repainted it. And we were able to get donation from Lynn Rudder, who has a paint business and uh, the color matched by Dr. Color, uh, if you're familiar with him. They are both members of the Artistic License Guild uh, who helped us quite a lot with a lot of our projects in the house. We have an exciting new set of buildings that have never been used by the Victorian Preservation Center in the past. They were always used by the Gilliland family. As you can see, these two old buildings, this building here is what you see here. And the next picture, I'll show you the different ages of the buildings, but we're trying to save the buildings and use these very large spaces as workshops for the future. So those two buildings were built in the nine, between 1900 and 1920, the next building uh, and, the and the garage. This building was built in the 1949, and then these buildings were built in 1954. So we have access to all these spaces to be able to use it for our gardening, to be able to set this up, to teach people how to rebuild their wooden windows and become more sustainable uh, by creating and having workshops for people to join us and learn with. Now we can't, do, we are not, we have no paid members. We have a board of four, unfortunately. We desperately need more people on our board. And you, if you have knowledge and would like to help us move forward, we're at an amazing place right now to grow. Uh, we actually have had a woman who is gifting us her estate, but she's not dead yet. So we are still working on getting the house ready for prepping it for painting and for the foundation work and things that need to be done until the money becomes available. And we desperately need help doing that. So if you like cooking, if you like cleaning, if you like working in the garden or singing as Sandy Mori far left sings for all of our teas or coming and decorating. We're gonna be decorating the house this Saturday and Sunday. If you're interested in coming, you're welcome to come. Hank Dunlap, who is a art uh, and textile historian, has been one of our mentors for the last 50 years. And our lives are so much better because he's been there. My mother and then Paul Roberts, who was the past president for many years, who uh, recently moved to Santa Cruz, along with Patty Reidenbach, was also on the board and recently retired off the board. So we are looking for new blood. Julie, is a great gardener and she is our treasurer and has made all the difference uh, to get her help and we need yours. You can help with collections. We have all the clothing that you would want to get your hands on. This is a group of women who came to sew tags in and the collections are all put on the computer and Nancy's been making this her life job to touch and get to know all of the pieces of not only fabrics but ceramics and beautiful items that go, these are all the original wedding presents that are still in the locations that they were put in in 1883 or 1884 when they got married. And these fabrics are just lovely. This is Karen talking about it. We're gonna create more videos for people to learn, not gonna spend too much time on it right now. If you wanna learn more about our collections, we actually, you can get on the hub, which is catalog it app and that's uh was created by dan rael and we were one of his pi test pilots and a lot of our collections that we want the public to be able to have access to are listed there so you can see without even coming to the house what we've got this is what the website looks like when you get there and you can link to our website once you're there to see some of the beautiful things that we have and again, there are very few houses in this country that are still intact the way we are. So you can come to events. We hope to reinstate the 12th night dinner, which you'll see in the upper left 
program, uh, upper left uh, corner there. Uh, you'll see tours. We do paranormal events. And down here is the gift shop. And Daniel wanted to make sure that I showed you more of Emilita's cards that are for sale there. We actually have beautiful Christmas cards that are for sale right now. If you're looking to sell, send people some beautiful cards, you can kind of see them here in this basket that Emilita created in the 1930s and 40s of San Francisco and the Sierra trees. And we also have paranormal events. I think that's my grandfather whispering in my ear, but there's no way I can figure out how that light got there and why that light looks like a man with a very clear eyes, nose, mouth, and a hat on. And it kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies, but I have no question they're probably spirits in the house. I mean, where else would they go? It's the only place around that's familiar to everybody. So our next program's coming up, but there are still room for if you want to come right away, we're going to be decorating the house this next week. But uh, December 18th, I think there's three or four places left on the house tour. It's just a house tour, no tea. Uh, but there is a tea. We call it our New Year's tea on January 7th. It's a tea and a tour. So you can come. I think there's a couple places left at the one o'clock seating and there's more places left at the 3 p.m. seating. And if you become a member, which you can get on our website and become a member tonight if you want to, there's going to be a members party from two to five on January 8th. Let's see. So this is getting to the end of my program. Luckily, COVID is over. We don't have to wear as many masks, so you stay safe. And if you want to come, you can come decorated in your holiday best and join us. But these are the ways you can help. If you do become a member and you join at $25 a month or $25 a year, it helps us immensely. Having, being able to count on that money every year means that we can do the needed repairs that come up every day. We also want to make sure that you know that if, if you know somebody that could help us, maybe you can't, but you know somebody that could, please let them know. And we need everybody's help in help saving this historic house. Help us fundraise. We need a fundraising committee to really push to get that money to do what we can before we get the big money. We're going to need a lot of money to rebuild the foundation and repaint the house and do all the other necessary repairs we weren't able to do yet. Come and volunteer. If you have no money, but you have time, give us your time. I guarantee you'll have a good time. And more importantly, share your expertise with us. We can really, really use your help. The thing I really like to leave at the end of this program, and this is the end, I promise, is that we have a house full of artifacts. And Emilita was thoughtful and a lot of the back of the picture, she has the names of who's in the picture. And luckily people have looked at the furniture and they've written some details about some of the pieces in our house. But you are the keeper of your history. You have things in your house that probably nobody else knows its history. And if you just take time tonight and go to one cherished spoon or one table and write the history about that item on the item and stick it to it or near it so that that history will continue because you made it happen. I do hope you enjoyed this program and I do hope that you come enjoy us at the house. And I'm going to stop sharing now and go to see your faces. If you have questions, now would be the time. If you haven't already, oh, there's 16 things in the chat. I'll have a chance to go there. Oh, there you all are. Hello. Thank you so much, Patty. That was such a great presentation. Definitely like learned, learned a lot and definitely encourage you all to uh, support the house in, in any way that you can. Um, we do have one question in the chat from Andrea Daniel. Was Do you know if Cohen was Jewish? And if so, did he acknowledge it? Um, he, the family was Ashkenazi Jews originally, but I think in order for them to own land, they stopped being practicing Jews. 
And that was never something we talked about. It was not something that my mother ever acknowledged that she was Jewish. I didn't know I was related to Jewish. And somebody would say, well, that's a priestly class. And it's like, oh, really? I felt for many years uh, kind of out of the know. It was not something that, that they practiced. He married a Quaker. And she talked to her sisters in these and thous. And that's kind of what that, Nan, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he, he was the middle of 13 children. Um, and, we, and we do have information about where his siblings went in the, in the world, but we don't really know what what was going on at that time. I'm sure he was surviving because he was Jewish. So it, it is hard to talk about, you know, either, the, again, these rich white people in this community because we're in, we're in the Fernside district. We're in a Hispanic low income neighborhood right now. And there's this huge old house, which everybody respects in the fact that it's the oldest house in the neighborhood. Um, but many of our neighbors don't speak English, um, but they're very nice people and they always wave and smile when we're working in the yard. And we're trying to figure out how do we fit into this part of Oakland because it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, and one of the ways that we're hoping that if we can generate workshops to train people in the crafts of rebuilding historic houses, I mean, technically everybody has a historic house. I mean, if it was new yesterday, it's that's it's old now, um, but people who, that have wooden windows or people that have broken furniture to be able to train people in crafts and focus on the neighborhood and see if we can train people in the neighborhood to take on these crafts. So a lot of these craftsmen are retiring and there aren't people interested in that business anymore. And it's really important. And we're hoping that we can find a niche to be able to push that forward. One of our advisor committee members is the uh, executive director of uh, the Crucible. And since she does workshops and she's going to be helping us kind of head in that direction, if we can do that. Any other questions? I think you know, that, that is cool that the house is almost like a laboratory for you know, a lot of different things. So that's cool that you're kind of trying to open it up to different people in the community to grow themselves and you know, preserve the house too. It seems like a symbiotic thing. So that's very cool. We did have one question from Albert Norman. Is there a connection between city buildings and Mr. Bray? And Albert, if you want to unmute and clarify if I got anything incorrect about your question. But yeah, maybe maybe to maybe to expand it. Are there any city buildings um, associated? Yeah, I thought there were some uh, city government buildings that had the Bray name on them. Um, if you know of some, I'd love to hear about it. I do know that in San Francisco, there's Cohen Alley because he had his law offices there. So I know that Cohen has a, an alley uh, and there's redwood trees in the alley. Uh, Nan's been there, I haven't been there before. Um, but I don't know about uh, any city uh, buildings in Oakland that have the Bray name on them. Yeah, Oakland, you guys know this. So when did Oakland become incorporated? 1852. 52, okay. because. Um, and but this Fruitvale was not part of Oakland originally, correct? And and Bray lost his property in 1885. So I yeah I would guess he would not be connected to any existing buildings. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? I have a question, uh, Patty. You said there are. Tiffany furnishings in the house. Uh, are, are are either of those two lamps behind your head, and Tiffany? I'm not in the house. Oh. The uh, the Wi-Fi there is not good enough to do a Zoom good, program no. yet. Um, okay. If you come and visit, or if you get on our website, or if you follow social media, I post quite a lot of pictures of the house, and you can go in and see them. 
but one of the gifts that is on the mantle came from Tiffany's, and it was a gift from the Sather family who gave oh. Sather Gate to UC Berkeley, and yeah. it's a beautiful uh, clock made out of onyx and two urns on either side, and we know that that's a gift from Tiffany's. Right, that's excellent. <laughs> I'm a, we don't have any, this is Nancy speaking. Um, I've been working on the collections there for over 20 years um, and um, continue to find new and refined many things. One of the things I found in a box just uh, <laughs> yesterday was an envelope. Well, here, I'll, oh, actually you can, oh, I can share it with you. So I brought it home and it's an envelope marked Christmas lists, 1889. And here is, uh, can you see this? No. No. Oh, let's see. Where's my, you should be able to see it because it's. From Just Michael. tell us what it is, man. Oh, it is a small <laughs> booklet. Um, and in it is written in, in Emma's handwriting, the Christmas gifts to make in 1889. And so there's, she for mama she was gonna do uh make a rug uh papa got oh i'm not sure what alfreda got a blanket alfreda was a baby then um and we have so we have christmas lists from 1889 and all the way up to 1931 um emma stopped keeping them but her daughter emilita kept lists of the cards that were sent, the gifts that were given, and the gifts received. And we I just, also, wow. em, Emma was a, a detailed person and she kept her daily household records. So that's a snapshot of Oakland, where she went shopping, how much things cost. It's, it's just this amazing time capsule of Oakland in a time when that area was the Piedmont of Oakland. It was the center. And we had a, a group of students from the University of Stockton, UOP, who um, came and did this wonderful research project on how the time changed from when the house was built to the 1920s and 30s, when the railway came through and the cotton mills were put in, and then... <coughs> everything was subdivided into the housing and the houses in the neighborhood were all built in the 20s and 30s. So it's quite interesting to see the major change that happened in Oakland in that particular period at that time. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? I have another question. Uh, you said W.A. Bray transported food and he owned a mercantile business in San Francisco. What kind of uh, uh, business? Was it a grocery store or did he sell... He focused, he focused on feed and grain. You saw the, the Alma was carrying the feed for the horses, but uh -huh. then he actually created a mill in Alviso. Oh, yeah. And I tried to find more history on that yesterday, and I could not find the history of that. So I've got to keep looking in my records. But it's it's hard when you, you know, you've it's the trickle down of parents and parents' parents and aunt, great aunts that tell you stories and Hopefully it's all going to stick and you try to compare stories with everybody else and find where it's written down. Um, it's a lot of history to remember, but that's that's what we we know that he did. Um, we know that Howard actually worked for the Montague and Locke company that made that range. And he created his own business making the Sparks stoves. So he had a business in San Francisco. And then in 1906, oh. when it was destroyed by the fire, he moved that business to Oakland. So we know that those businesses were there and it might have been um howard bray uh on some of the buildings that that were there versus watson augustus because again he was a businessman in oakland also oh, do you know the physical location of of his uh grain sales business uh watson augustus i don't know Bray. No. we watson know augustus, howard yeah. howard bray's uh, yeah. Stove store was on twenty seven. The the, uh, fa the factory was down on Twelfth uh, Street to build the stoves. Yeah, hmm. spark stoves. Okay. But, see, so we have lots of things in the house. We don't have any journals. We don't have any diaries. 
So the fun part is to come down and open up a drawer or open up, look at a book and say, okay, what does this tell us about what was happening in these people's lives, what was happening in the world at that time? It's just this really wonderful process of um, diving in and seeing if you can de deconstruct people's lives to see what was going on. So come and join me. It's lots of fun. And me. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Any, any other questions? All right. I think we'll close it out. We'll, we'll definitely send links to, you know, all, or an email to everyone about with all the information um, with regards to upcoming events and the catalog catalog it link uh, as well. And uh, thank you all so much for coming and for supporting the Cohen Bray house and definitely um, hope to see you soon on at, at the house and on a future, future OHA event as well. So thank you all and have a good night. Thank you, Daniel. And thank, thank you, you for recording. For sure. And we'll send out the happen. recording as well. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Good night. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm seeing all these people that came at the end. How many people actually came?